So let's continue with the management of circulatory shock. And so here's our patient who was brought in and he was confused. You can see the question mark on his head and he had a low blood pressure. So your working diagnosis was circulatory shock. And so immediately the first thing you do is you put in some an IV and you give him, start giving him some IV fluids. Even though you don't know the cause of it, you do know that uh, most likely he's going to need these IV fluids. Your friend, your colleague, says, I'll pop in an A-line for you and does so. So that's great because that gives you the ability to get a good blood pressure as well as frequent uh, blood tests as you need to. And so you do. You get an ABG and on your ABG you get a lactate and it shows that it's elevated, way elevated at 7. So you decide, yeah, this guy definitely is in shock. He's meeting those three conditions we had before. Low blood pressure, uh, hypoperfusion as evidenced by his altered mental status, and the lactate is elevated. So, how are we going to treat this guy? Well, you can see here that he's wearing a bow tie, and that's because he happens to be a very important person. All very important people wear bow ties. V-I-P. And so... That stands for the management of our patients with circulatory shock. So V stands for ventilate, I stands for infuse fluids, and P stands for pump. So let's look at each one of these, starting with V for ventilate. So the first thing you're going to want to do is put your patient on some O2. And so you'll use a bag valve mask or, or just a 100% by a non rebreather mask to get some oxygen into the patient because you know that oxygen is not getting to the tissues. That's one of the problems here. However, uh, this is not the final destination for our patient because they're probably going to worsen and get sicker and not be able to protect their airway. So ultimately, they do need to be intubated. So you put an endotracheal tube into the patient and hook them up to the oxygen. Now this has an, another added benefit in addition to protecting the airway. It also uh, allows you to uh, breathe for the patient. So you're taking the work of breathing away from the patient because breathing itself is a very, very metabolically expensive process. It takes a lot of oxygen just to breathe, to fuel all the muscles, the intercostal muscles, the diaphragm, etc. So if you breathe for the patient, then that oxygen can be free to go to all the other tissues that need it. However, there's one thing we should talk about when you intubate patients. You take uh, them from a negative pressure system to a positive pressure system. And what you might see is that they're going to drop their blood pressure. Let's take a look. So here's a set of, uh, here's a heart, a set of lungs. Now when you inhale, air is going to come in. And when, the way it comes in is because the chest walls they, ex they expand, and as they expand, they create a negative pressure, and that pulls the lungs out with it. Not only does it pull the lungs out with it, it pulls the blood vessel walls open too, creating more space in here for blood to get in. So you get increased venous return, increased blood in your heart, which then allows more blood to come out, increased cardiac output. So with inhalation, with a negative pressure system, with negative pressure ventilation, uh, we could have some increased cardiac output. Now let's see what happens when you intubate. When you intubate a patient, you turn that negative pressure system into a positive pressure system. So now uh, air is not uh, brought in by the chest moving, it's being shoved down this tube. And so now you have pressure being pushed outward everywhere. And so now you can see the pressure is pushing on all these blood vessels here. And it's going to make this smaller. It's going to collapse it some. So you're going to have decreased venous return, which means decreased blood to the heart, which means decreased cardiac output. So positive pressure ventilation could decrease cardiac output. It's just good to keep that in mind. So this was our discussion of the V for VIP, ventilate. Now let's look at I. I stands for infuse fluids. And what that really means is you want to give a fluid challenge. You're going to give them some fluid and see what happens. You're going to challenge them with it and see how they respond. Now the paper goes into four different aspects that we need to know about for a fluid challenge. And the four things are the type of fluid, the rate that you give the fluid, your objective, like what you're aiming for, and then when you want to stop because things are getting dangerous, so the safety limits. So what type of fluid do you need to give? Well, crystalloid is your go-to fluid. And that means either normal saline or lactated ringers. In rare cases, you might want to give something like albumin, but 
for the most part, you're going to give crystalloid. Then at what rate, at what rate do you want to give this fluid? And they recommend to give 300 to 500 mLs over 20 to 30 minutes. And then you see what happens. Uh, you're going to give it your boluses in these small amounts so that you could see what happens and then you could measure the objective. And what's the objective? You can wait for the blood pressure to go up. That could be your goal. Your goal for, could be for the heart rate to decrease or f to create some urine output. Now the one I use and most everyone uses is the blood pressure. We're going to watch the blood pressure. And when that starts coming up, we're, we're going to start feeling better that ah, we've achieved our objective. Now our ultrasound friends will say, you know what, I, my objective is actually to see that the tank is full, to fill up the tank, and they will ultrasound the IVC, the inferior vena cava. And when that is empty, when the tank is empty, they're going to see that IVC collapse with each breath because there's too much pressure. It's causing it to collapse. But when the uh, tank is full, there's enough fluid in there to prevent it from collapsing. And so that's another another thing you could look at. And finally, the safety limits. How do you know that you've gone too far? You know you've gone too far if the patient develops pulmonary edema. Now we've covered V and we've covered I. Let's look at P. So P is the pump. And so we need to support the uh, pumping of the blood. And what this really means is we're going to give drugs in order to help. And so let's take a look at this system uh, in a little bit more detail. So here again is our heart and our blood vessels. And the heart has beta receptors on it, as well, and the, the vasculature has alpha receptors. The beta receptors are responsible for increasing the heart rate and increasing the squeeze, or what we call the inotropy of the heart. And both of these, when they go up, they're going to increase cardiac output. Now, the uh, alpha receptors are responsible for the vascular tone, for increasing blood pressure. So they're going to squeeze down some and they're going to cause uh, the pipes to get a little tighter and so blood pressure will go up. Now if you go a little overboard with the beta, what's the danger? Uh, well, you could overtax the heart. It could be working too hard. And remember, there's not enough oxygen flowing around in the first place. So if you make the heart work too hard, it can start becoming ischemic. So we don't want that to happen. There's our little ischemic portion. Now what happens if you go a little overboard with the alpha. Well, you could squeeze these pipes so tight that it actually will decrease the amount of blood flowing through. So it's certainly possible that you could decrease cardiac output if you are, are going a little overzealous with these with your alpha uh, stimulation. So you, it's got to be a balance. You want to give just enough uh, to cause the greatest, greatest amount of cardiac output so blood can flow around. So what kind of drugs could we use? So the quintessential drugs for each one of these I've listed here. So the drug that's going to give you beta only is isoproterenol. So that's going to cause your heart rate to go up, increase squeeze as well. But you rarely are going to use this drug. The only time I've, see, I, I've seen it used is if when you want to try to increase the heart rate like you have someone whose heart is going really slow in certain uh, cases. You want to overdrive pace the heart. Now, if you want to give alpha only, you'd use a drug like phenylephrine. That's alpha only. That would give you a lot of peripheral squeeze. It's going to make the, the blood pressure go up. You, chances are you're not going to use this either. So what would you use? Norepinephrine is our go-to drug. This is the drug of choice. You can see here that it's mostly alpha, but it's got a little bit of beta on it. So it's mostly alpha, so it's going to give you some vascular squeeze, but it is going to to give, uh, it is going to cause the heart rate to go up a little bit and, and a little bit of inotropy. So norepinephrine, that's your drug of choice. And here are the doses for that. Another drug that's available is dopamine. And we used to use this a lot. And dopamine is beta at low doses and at higher doses it's an alpha agonist. Uh, but many studies have shown that it just is not, it doesn't work very well and it may even increase mortality in some cases. So I'm not even going to give you the dose for this because we're not, we're not going to use dopamine anymore. Another drug with a similar profile to dopamine is epinephrine. And so again, it's beta at low doses and alpha at high doses. And you might use this as a second-line drug if your norepi is not cutting it. If, you, if you're, you're maxing, up on the, maxing out on the norepi and you need to add something, you can use epinephrine. But otherwise, you rarely use this. Now, the one time that it 
does make good sense to use epinephrine is if you have someone in anaphylactic shock. If they got stung with a, by a bee and they're horribly allergic to it and their blood pressure drops into the toilet, uh, then it's time to use epinephrine because the epinephrine is going to help with the anaphylaxis. It's also going to help with the, uh, the blood pressure being low. Another vasopressor that we have is called vasopressin. And some people say in shock you can have a vasopressin depleted state. And so you want, might want to add this. And so here's a dose here. And this is a, a good second line drug as well, especially in septic shock. So the two drugs I would remember from here are norepi and vasopressin. And these drugs constitute our vasopressors. And we're really not going to use these that often. So it's mostly norepi and vasopressin. So that's good when we want to get some more vascular tone. What if we need to get the heart to do a little bit more work? We need a little bit more beta. Well, then there are three drugs we're going to look at here. The first is dobutamine, and this is an old drug. We used it a lot with dopamine, uh, but this one stuck around. Now, this one is mostly beta, and here's a dose, 20 mics per kilo per minute, and it's going to give you some inotropy. So if you need the heart to pump a little bit more, there's another drug, another class of drug. They're the phosphodiesterase type 3 inhibitors, milrinone and inoximone. And what these drugs do is they work by a different mechanism to get the heart to uh, pump a little bit more. And if you really want to know, uh, I looked it up, here's how it works. Okay, so the way that the typical one method is epinephrine comes in, it activates some G proteins, which then activates GTP, which activates adenyl cyclase, which turns ATP into cyclic AMP, and cyclic AMP does all of its stuff, the good stuff that we know about. Uh, now, cyclic AMP is broken down by phosphodiesterase into AMP, and what phosphodiesterase inhibitors do is it prevents the breakdown of this cyclic AMP to AMP. So now we have, ex we have this extra cyclic AMP sticking around to do all of its goodness. So that's how milrinone and inoximone work. And another drug that they mentioned, but you're probably not going to use, I've never even heard of until this article, is this levosimendin. Levosimendin. And what this does is it binds to the troponin C within the cardiac myocytes, which makes it more sensitive to calcium. And so now the, the heart is going to uh, beat more strongly because of that. It does have uh, an added effect of causing vasodilation. I drew a blood vessel here and you know it's getting dilated over here where the levosimendin has bound. And so that's not necessarily what we want happening. So that's one reason not to use it. Another reason not to use it is the half-life is several days so it's not something that we can titrate easily. If, it, if we overshoot it's going to stick around for a long time. So we're not going to use the levosimendin. So that was a quick look at the P for pump and that means we're going to get, use some drugs that uh, are going to help the pump out. And so we have our vasopressors, and then we also have our inotropic drugs here, the ones that help the heart squeeze better. And together with the V and the I and the P, we got our ventilate, infuse, and pump. And so these are our priorities in treating the patient who is presenting with cardiogenic shock. Sorry, I misspoke. Treating the patient who is presenting with circulatory shock. And so in the next video, we're going to go over a few more details that are left over in that article. But this is the meat of it. This is the meat of it. The different kinds of shock and how you're going to treat them. All right. Bye.